Welcome to another edition of Beyond Impressions. I'm your host, Jenny Slade, Senior Product Marketing Manager for Digital at Marketron. And joining me today is Katie Sokolowski, the Lead Associate Account Director at the Trade Desk. Welcome, Katie. It's so nice to have you here with us. Hi, Jenny. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, today we are going to discuss a topic that I know is on the minds of our local media sellers, which is the elimination of third-party cookies. This is something Google has delayed several times, but it appears they are now moving ahead with cookie deprecation for 2024. This has a lot of people concerned about the future of third-party digital advertising and how that's going to work without third-party cookies. So we'd love to discuss this topic with you, Katie. You are here to talk about the fallout and also the opportunity. So Katie, maybe you can kick us off by explaining what are third-party cookies and what is their role in the digital advertising ecosystem? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I like to give our clients at the Trade Desk a little bit of history lesson, so I'll do that for your listeners here on the call today. Um, but the cookie was actually developed back in the 90s by a Netscape web developer by the name of Lou Montuli. Um, he developed the use of, or the technology for the cookie um, really for kind of the e-commerce use case. So if a customer went to a website, put products in their shopping cart, um, they were able to then return to that website and have those you know, products still in their shopping cart and have the website remember um, exactly what they had wanted to purchase before. Um, that technology still stays the same today. Uh, it's a website really remembering the user preferences once you visit it uh, a second time at a later date. Um, but prior to its development, you know, websites really would view every single user that visited its site as net new. It would make you re-enter your password, re-add the products to your shopping cart. And so it was a really valuable innovation back in the 90s when it happened. Um, Lou Montuli talks very publicly about this, and it was much to his dismay. But during this development uh, back, uh, you know, in the 90s, um, the advertising ecosystem actually caught winds of this particular new piece of code that could be placed on a website and actually started to leverage it in the advertising industry in a much, much different format than it was originally intended to be used for. And so you talk about, uh, you know, we, we talk in the industry about third party cookies often, and that's really where Google's deprecation is uh, really coming to fruition. And there's a, a pretty clear delineation between first and third party cookies. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Right. Um, a, a first party cookie is placed on a browser by the website that you're on. So you visit a website, you're adding you know, products to your shopping cart, perhaps you're watching a video. It will remember you know, what volume you have your video at so that when you return a separate time, you won't be blasted with loud music in your ears um, or you won't have to re-add those products to your shopping cart. A third party cookie, on the other hand, same piece of technology is just placed by on your browser by a website that is not the website that you're on. So this could be a website analytics tool that's tracking the usage of the site for the website owner um, or a third party advertising platform that's really trying to monetize the content that they're producing through through advertising. Um, and so. Uh, the way that it's been used in advertising up until this point. Um, is really uh, twofold. One is websites will place a different cookie on your browser and use that identifier to target you uh, at a later date, something we call retargeting, um, or to track whether you've created an action after having seen an ad, um, what we call conversion tracking or attribution. Um, so kind of the history lesson, but that's really how it evolved into the way that it's currently used today and where Google is focused on uh, its current deprecation. Understood. I love your story because I think it highlights two of the, the main uses of cookies, right? One is to improve the user experience and the other is to, is to understand audiences and, and um, be able to monetize their behavior across the internet. So explain to us why is it that Google and other tech platforms are now moving away from third party cookies? Yeah, so um, there's quite a few reasons. Uh, Google and Safari, um, Safari was one of the first browsers that implemented some of the, the cookie list deprecation uh, policies, have really cited consumer privacy as one of the biggest concerns. Um, the truth of the matter is there's a lot of benefits that we get out of cookies, but the technology is pretty archaic. And like I talked about before with, you know, the use case that it was developed for, it, it really wasn't 
uh, you know, meant to be used in the, the facet that it's used today. Um, a couple of implications that exist because of that. Um, the consumer has little to no control over who's tracking their data and, and how it's being tracked. Um, they just see a pop-up that comes on their screen that says, hey, do you want to accept cookies? And they're like, I don't know what that is. Like, that seems scary. Um, a cookie in general is inefficient at understanding who a consumer is. A different cookie is placed on, you know, on each browser that you're using on a separate device. So as I move from my computer to my mobile phone to my tablet, like that is all considering me a different individual or a different identifier. And because of that inefficiency, there's not an easy way for advertising technology platforms to um, you know, communicate with each other. And so outside of some of the very public reasons and the consumer sentiment around privacy, which are very, very important, um, it has become alarmingly clear that as an advertising industry, we also need to shift away from um, the use of the cookie to make it more consumer and privacy centric, but to also make it effective and efficient um, for the use cases that we talked about before. Great. So it sounds like the industry is actually trying to move toward a solution that's not just more efficient um, for advertisers, but also better in respecting users' privacy. Does that sound right? So that's tell us about correct. the um, the shift to, to first-party cookies and first-party data. You mentioned um, that before. Tell us how it's different and how companies are making that shift. Yeah, so um, I'll, t I'll take your question on first party cookies and then I'll go into the first party data. Um, so many of the browser uh, companies, so Safari and Google Chrome that are creating the, the kind of the deprecation of the cookie policy um, have not drawn the same limitations on first party cookies as they have third party cookies. Um, if you remember, first party cookies are the ones that are you know owned by the website, they're used for consumer preferences. Um, and so there's some companies out there that are trying to shift their focus for the future of, you know, cookie targeting towards those more less regulated areas like first party cookies. Um, for all the reasons that I stated before and for also the consumer privacy concerns, um, we don't believe that that's really the best path forward. Um, and cookies, you know, aren't really the viable technology for effective uh, privacy safe advertising. So. Um, we believe that a shift towards a more cookie-less identifier is the best path forward. Um, I'll share with you a little bit about how the Tradis is thinking about that. Um, we are leading the development of a futuristic identifier called Unified ID 2.0 or uh, UID2 um, that is both privacy-centric and effective at operating kind of the same workflows that we see in an advertising industry today with cookies. Um, Unified AD 2.0 is based on an email address or a phone number. So we'll take that email address, uh, you know, hash salt and encrypt it, which essentially just means we're anonymizing it and making sure that it's secure so that a bad actor couldn't come and move that back into a email address or a phone number so you'd get spammed and called even more than we already are today. Right. Um, and, uh, and so that UID2 token can then in turn be taken um, and have uh, used for onboarding your first party data or for transacting in the bit stream. And so uh, in addition to just the technology behind it, we also are creating a consumer privacy portal that allows consumers to log in and be able to control who actually is able to access their data and you know, add or remove access as they see fit so that they feel like they have the control of where their data assets are being shared, um, where historically the, the cookie in the browser did, did not support that. Um, that kind of functionality. Great. So you've told us um, a little bit about how the Trade Desk is evolving to its technology to better respect our users' privacy and also create more efficient way to um, adapt to, to users' needs and, and desires and behaviors. But I'm wondering if you can touch on the what are the big picture consequences of making a shift away from third-party cookies? And I ask because in the end, businesses, advertisers need to make money, right? The NAB commissioned a study about this and found that broadcasters could see annual losses of up to $2.1 billion. And so they're recommending um, to mitigate that potential loss that advertisers shift to first-party data. So I'm wondering about your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. So 
as we shift into a more authenticated internet, there are kind of different ways that there are different implications that will come out. I think many of, much of it is to be seen, but there are a few very obvious things that will need to change in order for us to shift towards um, a non-cookie based future. And frankly, like if you do something for 30 years, it takes a hard time, a long time to, you know, to kind of take yourself out of it and move yeah. forward. But um, so there are some third party data providers that have only built their you know, data segments off of cookies or device IDs. Um, a lot of those data providers now are changing their data aggregation strategies to um, shift towards a futuristic identifier like UID2 that is an authenticated uh, interaction with the consumer and they're able to effectively track um, the data assets and build audience profiles for prospecting targeting um, in a much more futuristic and, and privacy safe way. Um, in addition, you know, from a consumer standpoint, consumers will need to interact with brands, advertisers, and, um, you know, websites a little bit differently. And so, um, you know, I think that there's uh, definitely something for our advertisers to consider in how they're interacting with their consumers and their customer base. Um, you know, first party data is a very valuable currency to the open internet and will continue to be even more and more valuable as we require, you know, further interaction with the consumer to be able to track their data. Um, this means that if you're a broadcaster, you know, selling into like a mom and pop flower shop down the street, um, seeing if your, you know, advertiser, your client has any email lists of previous purchasers or like a loyalty program that, um, they've been able to track previously. These types of customer data sets can be used as a starting point for your advertising efforts moving forward. Um, so you could take those email lists, onboard them to a platform like the Trade Desk through Marketron, um, and actually retarget those consumers to operate repeat purchases in that flower shop. Or you could take that consumer set and build a lookalike model on it to reach consumers that look the most like the people that have historically purchased from your flower shop. And so, um, there are a bunch of different ways that you can kind of adjust some of your top track to be able to cater to some of the new interactions that you need to have with advertisers. Um, but starting with that first party data is, is always great. Um, I will say though, I'll be the first to, to admit that the reality of the matter is not all advertisers have access to first party data. Um, so there's definitely plenty of other ways that you can um, coach your clients to, to uh, think about strategies outside of uh, first party data that are actually going to stay virtually. Uh, the same even as, as cookies do go away. Right. No, I think you've made a, a really important point, Katie, for, for every one of the 40 or so percent of people estimated, right, to have opted into Apple's um, do not track um, privacy restrictions when they went live a couple years ago, um, we hear that it, it's seven in 10 people who actually prefer personalized marketing. So um, I think collecting that first party data Maybe the, the note I heard you give to advertisers is go ahead and ask because most customers, most users do want a personalized experience at your at your um, property, your websites, your advertising. So that's great. Do you have any parting advice for our local media sellers and how they should discuss this with their advertisers? Yeah, absolutely. So um I would say start talking about what first party data assets your advertisers have access to. Um, do they have them in email list format? If not, are there different ways they can start to engage with their consumers now to begin to build those lists for better and more effective advertising in the future? Um, if your clients maybe don't feel comfortable sharing their first party data for advertising purposes, that's not uncommon. And there are definitely other ways that um, you can build effective marketing strategies without that first party data. Um, things like geolocation and contextual targeting are going to stay virtually the same, even as we shift to a cookie-less future. Um, uh, you know, channels like connected TV and audio are already not cookie-based, um, and so we'll see minimal impacts as we shift away from uh, cookies, you know, in a web browser environment. Um, and then, you know, platforms like the Trade Desk are continuing to focus our product innovations around different solutions like you know, innovation on graph coverage and being able to assess different data signals in the bid stream to be able to extend targeting even when we don't have an identifier where there's no first party data. Um, so as we continue to work collectively as an industry, there will be more and more effective ways um, to begin to operate in virtually the same capacity as we have with cookies, just 
much more privacy safe and privacy centric for the consumer. Um, so all in all a great thing, but um, continue to tie it back to first party data if you can. And uh, hopefully this is some food for thought, but you know, things won't be as, dr as drastic a, of a change as I think uh, they may have been anticipated to be. So best of yeah, luck. It sounds like we're evolving in the right direction. Katie, yeah. I want to thank you so much for telling us all about Unified ID and the work that Trade Desk is doing in the, the cookie space and for your fantastic tips for our broadcasters and advertisers. And thanks to our audience for tuning in. If you're interested in watching more episodes of Beyond Impressions, you can visit our Aspire website at aspire.mercatron.com.